Ready? I'm gonna help you out a little bit. I can start right here. Okay, hold it. Okay, hit record. Hello, this is Lecture Z, History 17, College of the Desert, Professor Ken Cosgrove. We're on the Civil War, part two. So I'm gonna drop this back down so you can see. Hello, it's me, <laughs> Gettysburg. That was a high watermark for the South. Robert E. Lee decided most battles were taking place in the South. His troops are starving. They're eating a McDonald's hamburger and a fry, small fry a day, marching 20 miles and fighting in a battle. They're starving to death. The North, Pennsylvania is known as the breadbasket of, of the United States at the time for wheat, cattle, He's gonna take his troops up north to resupply from the Norse um, warehouses. So that was his gamble. And then he's gonna take it July 1st, 2nd and 3rd, 1863. He goes up there and that's his high water mark. The North holds out and that's gonna be the beginning of the end of the Confederacy. Of course, it's gonna take another year and a half, but that's the beginning of the end. So Gettysburg averaged about 25,000 dead each day. Now the highest death mark was a battle in Antietam, Maryland, where I believe about 30,000 died in one day, just in one day, 30,000 dead. We're not counting the wounded in one day. So Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, if you get a chance to go up there and they have tours, it's really worth going through and you see the battlefield and to see what kind of a killing zone it really looks like. Now continuing with the Civil War, of course you have your worksheets, you have your chapter 15 to read, Remember your worksheets, you're going to save your notes. And on week 16, I'm going to try to send out an email to tell you what to do with it, an email, a class email. So just save your notes from those worksheets you have. So the Civil War, we had a couple other characters. McClellan was the first one. He reluctant to fight, according to your textbook. Ulysses S. Grant takes over for the North. He starts turning the tide, and the North starts winning some battles. The South is hanging on because of the genius of Robert E. Lee. He's keeping his troops alive. Now the North had a man, man, manpower advantage and a communication advantage and weapons advantage, but the South had one advantage. They're fighting on their home turf. They're used to rural traditions. They're used to hunting and fishing and riding horses. And remember, they're fighting to defend their home. You and I would fight much harder if someone's breaking in our home then someone's breaking into a home five blocks away, you might just call 911 and let the police handle it. But for the South, you're fighting on your home turf. So Robert E. Lee takes the North, it's a losing proposition, and now it's a slow death down. Now the North knows they can finally take this thing over. They can finally end the war, but it's gonna take some time. They have a general, William Sherman, who does something called total war. Total war means you're going to wipe everything out. He did 50 miles from Atlanta to the sea, killed everything, burned everything. He's going to break the will of the Southern soldiers who aren't home. They're away from their farm and ranches and fighting. When they come back, they'll see, oh, nothing but destruction. Now, you're going to watch in week 14, Glory, the movie Glory. It's the Massachusetts 54th Infantry. It's an all-black regiment that died heroically fighting for the North. Okay, so glory, when you get a chance, that's week 14, that's your assignment to watch that uh, movie, DVD. It's really, really historically accurate, and it's a good movie to give you an idea about the atrocities of the Civil War. Now, let me see what I had to get on to. So that's, uh, excuse me, the 54th Infantry was a black, all black regiment that fought bravely and suffered heavy casualties at Fort Wagner just so you have that in your notes. Now the prison camps, how are you gonna, your soldiers like the South, Andersonville was the absolute worst in the South. 13,000 Union soldiers died of starvation and malnutrition. But if you're a Confederate soldier and you only have a hamburger, McDonald's small burger and a small fry, are you gonna share it with all these prisoners? Probably not. You have to survive yourself. So both the North and the Southern prison camps at least uh, thousands died from exposure, overcrowding, and malnutrition. The falling is a result 
of the Civil War. Then I'm going to talk about President Lincoln. Slavery was abolished, number one. Number two, the concept of succession was discredited. You can't leave the Union without permission. And C, or number three, power in national politics was transferred from the South to the North. Remember in the lecture why we talked about all the presidents before the Civil War were from the South, Southern slave owners, that is. Okay, so that's the results of the Civil War. Civil War ends, of course, 1865. President Grant's going to receive General, excuse me, President Grant, he was president later. General Grant is going to receive uh, the sword from General Lee. Now, President Lincoln, and it was at a courthouse, Appomattox Courthouse. Appomattox Courthouse is where Lee surrendered to troops, Ulysses S. Grant. Now, President Lincoln, he's going to sign his own death warrant. Remember, in Lecture Y, 600,000 men and boy soldiers died. We're not talking about civilians. There's a number of civilian deaths, too. But 600,000 men and boys soldiers died. Okay? Lincoln says the South can re enter the Union with 10% swearing allegiance back to the Union. 10 out of 100. 10 cents on a dollar. A lot of people in the North were really upset with Lincoln for ordering that decree, and five days later, he's going to be assassinated at Fort Theater. All right, so that's Lincoln's um, death signature is what he did. Later on, they do a comparison between uh, Lincoln and John F. Kennedy. There's a lot of comparison with different numbers and all that stuff, but John Kennedy wanted to end the war in Vietnam, and he's assassinated a month later after he does a decree in 1963, in October, withdraw 1,000 or 15,000 troops a month out of Vietnam, he's dead. And so eventually, 3 million go to Vietnam. That's history 18. And the draft is heavy. Now, let's talk about Lincoln. Lincoln, there was an attempt on his life in 1864, but we didn't know about it at his inauguration. Five of the conspirators are sitting on the right side of Lincoln, standing, excuse me, on the right side of Lincoln while he gives his inauguration address. They were thinking Lincoln was going to exit stage right. Instead, he exited stage left. And so those five dummies couldn't capture Lincoln or shoot Lincoln, whatever they were planning on doing. The reason we know is in 1957, Matthew Brady was a Civil War photographer, the top photographer at that time. He had such a big ego that if he made a mistake, he would take his pen knife and put an X through the, the plate. The plate's about an eight by 11 sheet of paper, but he would save all the plates. And there were some people researching Civil War photos and they noticed the inauguration. And on the bottom of the right, they noticed these five dummies. Reason Lewis Payne was one of the assassins a year later, six foot five, 250 pounds, big man. He stood out. And so when they did a closer examination, they go, oh, my God, were they going to kill Lincoln in 1864 at the inauguration? Well, they got him in 1865. The war ends. Washington, D.C. is crazy. Soldiers are shooting, getting drunk, shooting weapons in the air, riding all over. Uh, people are afraid staying home. As you know, 4th of July sometimes or New Year's, people uh, shoot guns out, out here, too. And uh, you want to stay inside from midnight to then after or whatever on New Year's Day to stay safe. They were shooting guns all over. Lincoln decides with his wife, Clara, that, hey, I'd like to take you out since the Civil War ended. I would like to take you to Ford Theater, see our American cousin. He's going to ask Ulysses S. Grant to join him. But Ulysses S. Grant and his wife do not like Lincoln's wife. They're not the best of friends. And so he says, no, I can't go because my son's coming home from the war and we want to spend time with him. So Lincoln goes down through the list, gets a major raft from and his girlfriend, and they're going to attend in the presidential box at Ford Theater. Of course, when they come in, the band, uh, excuse me, the play stops, they salute the president, coming in, they play the president's song. Now, by the way, the president's favorite song, which I find hard to believe, he would have the U.S. Union Army Band play it nightly for him, at the White House. That wasn't a battle hymn of the Republic. 
the union song. He had him play Dixie. <laughs> I find that ironic. That was his favorite song. Anyhow, Lincoln attends uh, the play, and we know John Wilkes Booth, the assassin. He jumps on the stage. He shoots Lincoln behind the ear right here. Now, today, the doctors claim they could, with the bullet was so right in his eye. They said that they could take the bullet today by taking your eye out, disconnecting everything, you know, taking it out, pull the bullet from the front. Back then, they didn't know any better. They were probing from the back, and they actually were hemorrhaging the president. They took him across the street to Peterson's house. If you go to Washington, D.C., you want to visit all these places. He goes across the street. He's 6'3", 6 6'4". 6 He's got to be diagonal across the bed. A lot of his people um, were there to try to help him as best they could come running. Number two was the vice president, Johnson. Now, John Wilkes Booth went to the Kirkwood house where Johnson lived, but John Wilkes Booth, the assassin, had about five girlfriends' pictures in his wallet when he was killed. He goes to the vice president and leaves a note. We know it's his note. They authorized, uh, you know, authenticated his handwriting. He goes, oh, sorry I missed you, VP. John Wilkes Booth, or JWB. Okay. The third in command, Secretary of State, was Seward, who ran against President in 1864. Seward was in his house. He had a carriage accident. He's in like an iron lung going around. And so his daughter is protecting him, his son. He has an army uh, soldier. Louis Payne, that six foot five assassin, shows up at the house with a bogus uh, note that, hey, I have medicine for Mr. Seward. The butler answered the door. The butler is a black man. Uh, Louis Payne is an army deserter from Gettysburg, but he's very racist. He says, get out of my way. Now he's six five, big man. He just shoves him out of the way, starts climbing the stairs. There's a soldier there to protect the president. He sees a soldier. He stabs him, doesn't kill him, incapacitates him. He's coming up the stairs. The son of Seward is up there, comes out of one of the bedrooms. He gets stabbed and shoved out of the way. His daughter, Fanny, Seward's daughter, named Fanny, was reading a story to him and sitting in his bedroom. She sees him coming up the stairs, closes the door, hysterical. Louis Payne comes in, jumps on the bed, begins stabbing Seward all over the body, but Seward's wearing a metal brace. Like today we have, you know, a plastic case, but the, the knife's not going through. He wrestles him to the ground with Fanny, fighting him on the back, and he cuts him from the ear to the mouth. So his tongue and, and everything is hanging out. From that point on, when Seward's gonna survive, he never had his picture taken face on. He had all his face sideways on his picture, just a little historical note when he survived. The fourth in command was Edwin Stanton. Edwin Stanton and Lincoln did not like each other. Stanton was furious that Lincoln was letting the South back in without reconstruction. And so Stanton was in charge of the bodyguards. Lincoln's number one bodyguard was named Eckert. Now, Major Eckert, you know what Popeye looks like with those big forearms. Major Eckert would go to bars and he would bet people, I don't know what they call the iron pokers, the, you know, the flip the logs out of a fireplace. So we'll say iron pokers. He'd tell everybody, put five bucks on the table. Pick one of you guys and you get one shot. I'll put my arm out and try to break my arm. You break my arm, the money's yours. You don't, I collect all that money. He never had his arm broken. He was a tough son of a gun. But he didn't work that night. We don't know if Edwin Stanton pulled him off. And because, you know, who knows? Or did Eckert want the day off? You know, the war just ended. So Stanton assigns a drunkard to watch Lincoln. Well, when Lincoln's at the play, his bodyguard is supposed to be behind him. He goes next door to Tartable Tavern. It still has a plaque on the door next to the Ford Theater. He's over there pounding drinking, having a good old time, comes back in the theater, sees Lincoln up there with Major Rathbone, everybody's happy, and he's just sitting in the back watching the play when John Wilkes Booth does it. Now, John Wilkes Booth jumps the stage, breaks his leg, says death to tyrants, heads down south. There's only one bridge that wasn't closed at that time, the Washington Navy Bridge. Did he get lucky and go down there? That's the bridge he escaped to go south. You know, when Kennedy was assassinated, all the power went on in Washington, D.C. It's ever Dagger Hoover's office. So it's kind of some similarities they bring up on this. 
anyhow, John Wilkes Booth is eventually captured. Um, uh, about eight days later, I forgot the exact days, but about a week later, he's captured down south. His leg was set by a man named Dr. Samuel Mudd. Now, in history, if they say your name is Mudd, it comes from Dr. Samuel Mudd. Dr. Mudd claimed he didn't know that Lincoln had killed, was killed by John Wilkes Booth. Remember, they didn't have cell phones or internet. And people in Oregon, the state of Oregon, did not know Lincoln was dead for two months. So, you know, communication was slow. So he got arrested, and had Dr. Samuel Mudd, his name was finally cleared by President Jimmy Carter. So if you ever hear that term, your name is Mudd, put down. It comes from the Civil War, Dr. Samuel Mudd, okay? And uh, so Lincoln would have survived today's doctor, it's been blurry, but he had uh, some other diseases too and may not have survived that. But Lincoln, really, considered number two president besides George Washington. He was against slavery, but tried to keep the Union together. And when the war was over, he showed compassion and said, 10% of you soldiers swear allegiance to the United States. Union, you can re-enter the Union, no penalty. Keep your weapon, keep your mule, go back home and uh, farm and get started with the country again. With his death, unfortunately, reconstruction. And then we have some other problems that you'll see when you take History 18. This ends your lecture, Z, for History 17. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm still working on trying to figure out how to do Zoom. Uh, so I miss seeing everybody face to face. But anyhow, you stay safe, you stay healthy, and we'll keep in touch. Thank you very much. And you're ready for your final exam, which is week 16. Don't forget, you got to turn it in by the assigned date. And they got to email me your answers and make them, you know, not, they're not one word answers. So make sure you complete that test when it comes out. That's your final exam for History 17. God bless. Take care. Thank you. Okay, Kate. Katie. Hey, they're all done. All done with 17. You can wipe it. I have to have you edit. I'll be in here when you do it. Yeah, that was a better picture of showing the dead.